legalizing recreational cannabis in New Mexico. It's not a new idea, certainly, but with new governor and a stronger Democratic control of the roundhouse, many wonder if this will be the year lawmakers decide to light this particular flame. Supporters say it would create more than 10,000 new jobs and bring in millions upon millions of dollars in new revenue, but Governor Lujan Grisham didn't mention the issue at all in her State of the State address. Correspondent Gwyneth Dolan sits down this week with one of the lawmakers behind this year's legislation and to ask him why now and how exactly the process would work. Senator Jerry Ortiz Pino, thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, delighted. I want to ask you, recreational marijuana is legal in 10 states. Uh, medical marijuana in 33 states, including New Mexico. Why should we be the next to legalize recreational cannabis? Well, in my mind, the main reason is that the, the effort at dealing with anything like alcohol or a drug by simply prohibiting it and making it illegal is doomed to failure. And we've seen repeatedly in New Mexico that marijuana is freely available on the black market where it's, where its quality is not in any way maintained or controlled, where it's, uh, the profits go out of state or to the cartels or to some you know, neighborhood uh, uh, dealer, not taxed, not regulated in any way, and that people still are getting into trouble, losing jobs, having to, to uh, uh, lose housing sometimes because of their use, not being able to apply for certain fields. It, it, it's an approach that's just doomed. It's, it, it doesn't work, it doesn't keep marijuana from being used, and what it's doing is making it incredibly profitable for people who want to violate the law. And so this is a way of controlling that we've adopted for tobacco, for alcohol, for other substances that nobody is encouraging you to try, but that we think probably is better to do by regulation, taxation, rather than by an outright prohibition, which simply drives the price up. Legalizing marijuana would change so many things, a lot of which we haven't even thought of. Can you give me an idea? This is a really big bill, 140... 140 pages in the latest iteration. So what's in this thing? What are some of the ways that this would change our lives? Well, uh, first of all, we would say it's still illegal for children, for anybody under 21 to use it. We're not going to open the door for, for, for uh, child use. Um, we are saying that adults can make up their own mind about it, as they are doing already, and that if they do, they have to buy it from a producer who is licensed by the state, through a dispensary that's licensed by the state, with product delivered from the producer to the dispenser by a courier that's licensed by the state. All of it can be tightly regulated and taxed, and the producers have to pay license fees. And then you use those revenues for education programs about the dangers of drug use, you use those for treatment programs for people who have problems associated with drug abuse, and you use those monies to help pay for the Medicaid program that pays for health care for, for the whole state and for public schools. So a lot of it goes right into the general fund, any revenue generated. But, but isn't the, that a little bit backward? I mean, legalize the drug and then you use the tax revenue from it to treat people who have drug problems. Yes, because the, you know, the connection between marijuana use and some of the more dangerous or, or, or hardcore drug, drugs like uh, methamphetamine or cocaine or heroin, there's no direct connection. A lot of people use marijuana and never use those drugs at all. Some people use those drugs who just never were interested in marijuana. Two different entities completely. So and you're so taking this is tax on marijuana money and spending it on heroin and yeah, meth exactly. and cocaine. But and, and marijuana for, for centuries has been a plant that's been used in traditional cultures here in New Mexico and elsewhere. And is you know, it grows wild, you know, when it's not being uprooted by uh, DEA agents or the or the Justice Department. And it and it is something that people recognize has value in terms of helping people relax helping people you know, have a better appetite, gets over nausea. There's a lot of ways in which it's useful, but it can also be abused. And so you, know, you don't want to have kids using it because there's some evidence that children who use it affect their development of their brain. So you want to wait until their adults can make up their own mind. And then if they voluntarily choose to relax with it or to use it as a, as a way of uh, enhancing their social life, you can do that. 
You know, you brought up children, and a lot of people are mm. like, what's the big deal? It makes bad movies funnier. This is going to be a great mm. time. They're, they're, <laughs> but there's so much we don't know about marijuana, largely because the federal government has prevented people from doing very much research on yeah. it. You know, a couple of years ago, the National Academy of Medicine put out this analysis of the scientific literature, almost 500 pages of this, and almost the whole report is, meh, we don't know. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. we have no idea whether it helps with this or that, or how much uh, the dosage should be for epilepsy for a four-year-old or a 12-year-old or for a pregnant woman or a, a person with cancer. We know less about marijuana in these ways than we do about almost any other drug. Why, you know, does this concern you? Should we make this broadly available even though we don't well, know that much? Well, first of all, it's gonna be, I mean, it, the point of legalizing isn't it to make it more available, it's already widely available. There's no high school kid in this city who if he really wanted to couldn't score some marijuana by you know, dinner time tonight. So it, it, the, the, the whole thing of, oh, you're just making it more available. No, it's already available. I hate to tell you, you can find it anywhere if you really want it. What we're trying to do is to make sure that it's done in ways that, that limit the social damage caused by. Now, and one of the things, you, you made a really wonderful point with the, the lack of research. We are, are in, in our bill, we set aside 2% of the state's revenue to go to the University of New Mexico for research into, uh, it could be other, I shouldn't just say UNM because New Mexico State has a, a agriculture department that might very well want to do some of this research, into marijuana and into the effects. Luckily, there are, there are countries where marijuana is legal and where there has been some research. So, yeah, in the United States, the amount of scientific literature is not great about it, but there is more and more evidence internationally that shows there are ways in which it can be abused, but that for most people, in using it in, in moderation, it won't create emotional problems, psychological problems, it won't somehow damage your chromosomes or any of the scare stories that we were brought up with. But there is a, a link, you know, there's a, a new book just out last week, in fact, mid-January, called Tell Your Children, which is sort of a joke, that was the original title of Reefer Madness. Really, was it? Was yeah. It, oh, that's where it came from. Written by a former New York Times reporter, it's getting a lot of attention because he makes this argument that m smoking marijuana um, for people who have mental illness increases the likelihood of psychotic episodes and violent behavior. Now, critics say there may be a correlation between people who smoke marijuana and people who have psychotic episodes, but we don't know whether it's the one is causing the other. But the fact that there is a correlation there, does that worry you? There's a correlation between lots of things that, 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 that raise concerns of that sort. What we don't know is whether, which came first, was the schizophrenia there and, and the use of marijuana and attempt at moderating the, the effects of the schizophrenia, self-medication kind of attempt, or was the, there somehow some causation between smoking marijuana, inducing schizophrenia? We don't know that, we really don't. But, but the harsh fact remains that right now, schizophrenics are smoking marijuana probably within six blocks of the studio here. And, and there's no, you know, it's, it's like we've said, it's bad, you can't do it, so we forbid it, and we'll punish you if you do it, but there's no way possible of enforcing that, and so it, it's like prohibition. There was more rampant drunkenness during the prohibition era, they say, I wasn't around, <laughs> but, but they say that, that was, it was rampant in those days. And, and so that's kind of what we have here, I think. By treating it like it's got a mystique of its own, I think we're making it more attractive to young people, for sure. But beyond that, it's also, you know, a, a futile. We're not going to get anywhere by doing it that way. Let's try a different approach. And if there are, if the science begins showing there really are li li links between mental illness and, and marijuana use, well then, now we'll know what we, we have to make sure that people who are going to use it aren't going to be susceptible to that. We have to find out ways to control and regulate it, not just prohibit it. So uh, the bill calls for taxing it. How much money are you projecting that it could bring in? We don't know how many people use marijuana now. Uh, we don't know how many people will continue to use the marijuana they've been growing in their backyard for all these years and not having to pay any tax on it. But conservatively, we think we could raise, because um, 
the tax, I should just say something about the taxes. First of all, there'd be a 9% uh, tax on the sale at the, at the retail end, with the local municipality or county being able to tack on three more if they chose. So that would be 12% that would go to, for governmental purposes. And then there's li each of the licenses would produce fees that would also go into the state government coffers. Licenses for uh, for production for 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 a dispensary, you know, somebody who's going to sell it at the retail end, for people who manufacture the edibles, each of those would need a license, and so those licenses would would also generate some revenue. But conservatively, we think we could raise probably twenty five million dollars a year of additional state revenue in the first year. And how much would it cost to set up this whole new regulatory system? Well. The way the bill envisions it, we, we turn it over to the same department that regulates alcohol, now the Department of Regulation and Licensing in the state. And um, there will certainly be costs associated because you have to staff up, you have to publish the regulations. A lot of the bill leaves the details to this new department. That, it's not a new department, but the state agency that would be responsible for handling this new product. And so there's going to be a certain cost, but all of those costs could be uh, uh, taken from the revenue generated by the fees. You have a Democrat-controlled legislature. You have a lot of supporters there. The governor has said she supports it, but she didn't even mention it in her State of the State address. Right. You've been working on this for eight years. How do you feel about its likelihood of passage this year? Well, I think it, I think it will almost definitely pass the House. Uh, you have a lot of new members of the House. A lot of them uh, have already indicated this is something they think should be done, that we should be you know, making an effort to capitalize on the benefits of having a legalized marijuana. Reduction in social costs, but also the real estate, the, 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 the building and, and, and the tourism that would be attracted, particularly on the east side of the state. So there's a lot of advantages financially beyond just the tax revenue to the state. But uh, the Senate has not changed. We have, uh, you know, uh, pretty much uh, an older legislative body, um, a more conservative legislative body. I would say even the Democrats in the uh, in the Senate tend to be uh, more conservative than their counterparts in the House. I I think that's going to be the battle, and I think it'll only be decided if the governor does indicate that she's read this bill. Because what she said was she could support it under certain conditions and if. The medical marijuana program were protected, and we think we've done that. If children will not be able to have access, and there won't be, there will be a prohibition against, you know, advertising. Uh, you, if you have a license and then you advertise to kids, you'll lose your license. Uh, against, um, and then some, some uh, provisions around DUI. That's the other big issue. She said those three issues. If this bill deals adequately with those three, she might be willing to support it. Well, our job is to convince her that it is, and then to ask her to talk to some of the the members of the Senate who might be opposed. Twist now, arms. I, yeah, and I don't think it's just Democrats because I think there's there are several Republicans who've indicated to me that under the right set of circumstances, and they want to read the bill, they might be pr persuaded to vote for it too. And if if we p could pick up two or three Republican supporters, that would help a lot. Senator Ortiz Pino, thank you so much for coming in and talking to us about this. Well, I'm glad you're interested in it. Thanks.